Good afternoon, good evening. It's a pleasure to welcome you all and thank you for all for coming on a stormy Chicago night. Uh, Chicago has an advantage in winter, but certainly in summer. But one great uh, thing Chicago has to offer is excellent institutions, education, research, culture, and outstanding museums. And I would say one of these outstanding museums is standing out, which is the Field Museum, one of the two great research museums in the United States, together with uh, the Smith Smithsonian. And uh, it's a pleasure to talk today to Dr. Thorsten Lumpsch, uh, Vice President of Science Education at the Field Museum, uh, actually celebrating 20 years at the Field Museum uh, this year, but in this function overseeing uh, collections, integrative research, science action and learning. But today uh, we want to talk about your field of research, where you are the, the curator. Would we be in England? Uh, we would call it the, the legions. Here in the US, it's called the lichens. So we stick to the, uh, to the US version. So Dr. Lomsch is a leading expert in the field, uh, has published 500 papers, 20 book chapters, chapters, five books in active research collaborations with uh, universities and institutions around the world and field work in a dozen countries including Australia, India, Kenya, Thailand, Vietnam and also I think we will talk about that a little bit uh, Antarctica. Uh, Dr. Lomsch has also be, is the past president of the International Association of Lichenology and lecturer at the University of Chicago and also advising graduate, graduate students at the University of Illinois in Chicago. We could go on and on, but that's the, the short version. Dr. Lomsch, thank you so much for joining me, joining us. Uh, tonight and uh, sharing some aspects of your field of uh, research. Let me start with uh, an excerpt of uh, Henry David Thoreau's diary. He wrote on October 10th, 1858. I think the season is quite important in, uh, in this. So he wrote the simplest and most lumpish fungus has a peculiar interest in us compared with the mere mass of earth because it is so obviously organic and related to ourselves, however mute. It is the expression of an idea, growth according to a law, matter not dormant, not raw, but inspired, appropriated by spirit. If I take up a handful of earth, how separately interesting the particles may be, their relation to one another appears to be that of mere juxtaposition position generally. I might have thrown them together thus, but the humblest fungus betrays a life akin to my own. It is a successful poem in its kind. I don't know how scientific uh, <laughs> Thoreau's observation is. However, would you agree that fungi are like a poem? Well, first of all, <laughs> I like a poem better than what uh, Carl von Linné, the founder of botanical mm -hmm. taxonomy, said about fungi. He called them the Rustiti pauperimi, which translates roughly as the poor peasants of nature. <laughs> um, so I think um, there is some uh, truth in the observation uh, because uh, fungi play an important role in the um, 
cycle of life and especially of carbon in nature. So without them as decomposers, we would end up with a lot of carbon. And in fact, the reason why we have coal from the carbon, carboniferous mm -hmm. time is that um, the wood in general is difficult to digest. So termites need uh, protozoans in their guts to digest uh, uh, wood. However, at this time in the Carboniferous, there were the fungi that now digest wood have not evolved. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why we have all this coal. But in later <coughs> geological times, there was less or no coal that, that developed. Mm -hmm. uh, so they play an important role. And I think they are overlooked in a way, but mm -hmm. they are present everywhere. So in a piece of soil, you have a lot of different species. You cannot see them, but nowadays with DNA sequencing methods, you can easily detect their DNA and you can find that you have hundreds of species in uh, mm -hmm. just a, a, handful. a handful of soil. Mm -hmm. uh, now we all believe that we know what fungi are. We might think of truffles. Uh, what are lichens and how do they relate to fungi? Lichens uh, are a kind of fungus that has a specific uh, symbiotic relationship, as mm -hmm. we call it. Fungi are kind of similar to plants, <clears throat> that they are not running around and, and getting their food and can eat it. They are just sessile. <clears throat> but they are different to plants because they cannot just live from the sun. They cannot do photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. So they have to find other ways to survive. And there are ways you can parasitize other organisms. The ergot fungus that produces LSD is an example of a parasite on grass, especially uh, rye, um, and uh, parasitizes on these plants. There are some fungi. They have been popular recently because of TV series that can affect uh, arthropods. By the way, these fungi are not very likely to attack humans, so you can be <laughs> relaxed. The reason is not that the fungi cannot switch to other groups of organisms. They do this all the time in their evol over evolutionary time. The reason is that we are too warm for them. And the arthropods, they are as warm as their surrounding. Um, but however, there are some fungi that like to live in humans, and some even attack the brain. So you shouldn't be too, <laughs> too safe on that. <clears throat> so parasitism is one way. Another one is, we already mentioned this, decomposing. Mm -hmm. But then we have mutualistic relationships. We wouldn't have trees, or some hypothesis say that we wouldn't have land plants without fungi. Mm -hmm. So the earliest fossils of land plants have already shown some relationships to fungi that we call mycorrhiza. From the Greek, mucos is uh, fungus, and rhizos is, is the root. So they already help, help these early land plants to, to survive and to get nutrients. Mm -hmm. Lichens now are, again, mutualistic uh, symbionts, but they are fungi together with algae or cyanobacteria. Mm -hmm. As we see, this is a very specific field of uh, botany you're working in. and. I've learned that many questions are still pending uh, conclusive scientific results. But I, I understand that you have been become interested in, in lichens uh, very early on and that the one day Mark Bin in front <laughs> of a bookstore had a decisive role leading to the publication of your first scientific paper at age 15. Well, I'm not sure that it's really a scientific paper, but... <laughs> 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 uh, 
Yeah, <clears throat> I, I was very much interested in nature in general, and my parents gave me a microscope, and I, I frequented, frequently I went to this bookstore and looked for cheap books, and there was this one book that was only one Deutschmark, a textbook on lichens, and I had absolutely no idea what that is. So I started to read it and then look for lichens, uh, which was at that time not that easy in Frankfurt because lichens are very sensitive to air pollution, so there mm -hmm. were not very many uh, species around. But then I went to an um, open day at the University of Marburg and the author of this textbook was there and I was the only visitor of the lichen exhibit. <laughs> so she started talking to me and I told her that I even read this textbook, and she said, well, that's me, I'm the author of this <laughs> book. And then she, and the reason why this was so cheap is she was, she, when she wrote the book, she went on a six month field trip to South America. When she came back, she was very angry when she saw the book on her, on her desk because her name was misspelled on the oh. title page. So that was the reason, and I was, I think without this uh, typo, I would not have been interested in, in lichens. Yeah. And she was probably very surprised to see a young man, or rather a young uh, boy, yes. interested in that uh, complex field. And huh? then she would invite me to come. I stayed for a week uh, during summer holidays to work in the herbarium, mm -hmm. and so, uh, so I was... And then when she... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, brought me with her on a field trip to uh, New Zealand for six weeks, then I knew this is what I want to mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. You can travel the world and you can call it work. <laughs> field trips, uh, could you give us a little impression what field work for you looks like? Uh, being very close and dear to you, um, as once told me that when <coughs> climbing a hill during your excursion, you advance about a meter every two hours. Well, um, the most interesting lichens are the really tiny and small ones. Mm -hmm. And you really need to look with a hand lens uh, very carefully. And this might take a little bit of time, but it's exciting. So you forget about the time when you, when you look for them. It's probably not that exciting for people who are not really interested in these lichens. So you really have to uh, find a group where you just have enthusiasts of lichens with you. Otherwise, um, you have a lot of complaints. Mm -hmm. We get back to this handful of earth, which is so exactly. complex. Huh? <laughs> yes. So there, there is an international bestseller about uh, fungi entangled life which has three subtitles uh, I would like to refer to. The one is how fungi make our worlds. In one of, the, of your articles intended for the general public, you have cited renowned Canadian lichenologist Trevor Gow Goward, who described lichens as fungi that discovered agriculture and that Albeit mostly hidden, fungi are all around us, playing indispensable roles in ecosystem functions and impacting our daily life in multiple ways. Could you explain a little bit why and how fungi are so important? Well, let's start with uh, wine and beer. So there would be no wine or beer without mm -hmm. fungi because the yeast that produce the alcohol are fungi. Uh, you already mentioned uh, truffles as another mm -hmm. example. Um, but even when you look at trees, there is basically no tree uh, that does not uh, have any relationship with some kind of fungi that are associated with them and that, that these fungi, they actually provide the trees with nutrients. So they have a very important role in the ecosystem. And then of course we already mentioned the decomposing effect that is very very important. Um, so 
uh, fungi play uh, a role even in the tropics when we see uh, uh, leaf cutter ants, for example. Mm -hmm. They don't actually eat leaves. And why is that? Why don't they eat the leaves? Well, a lot of tropical leaves are poisonous. So instead of eating it, they collect the leaves and they bring it into their nest. And in this nest, they cultivate fungi. These fungi mm -hmm. decompose the leaves and the ants eat the fungi. So this way they avoid being poisoned by, mm -hmm. the, by mm -hmm. the toxins in the plants. I've also read somewhere that for trees in a forest or <clears throat> fruit trees, it's important that they can communicate with each other. And if yeah. they're cut off, uh, they may die off. So fungi, I suppose, play also a role in this communication between trees. Yes, the, the fungi produce like a network in mm -hmm. the soil, which connects different species or different uh, individuals of the same species. And there is evidence that there is some communication going on. However, this network can also be misused. So there are a lot of parasitic plants that basically get connected to a fungal network and then just take the nutrients out without providing any service. And these are kind of, can I say ugly, uh, looking plants that, that do not have any chlorophyll because they get all the nutrients from other trees that they, they basically take those. But they use the fungal network for that. They don't directly attack the, fung the, the other tree. They use the fungus for their purposes. Parallels with the internet and uh, IT, <laughs> IT communication. Uh, the second subtitle I've mentioned of this book, How Fungi Change Our Minds. In the same article for the general public, uh, you, have written, you have written that lichens are the symbiotic outcome of open interspecies relationships. It seems that Swiss botanist Simon Schwendener's claim that two different species could come together in the building of a new organism with its own separate identity was shocking to many. In the meantime, lichens have become the gateway organisms to the idea of symbiosis, an idea that ran against the prevailing currents in evolutionary thought. Yeah, there was, um, actually when Simon Schwenner 150 years ago first uh, suggested that lichens are a symbiotic organism, all the leading lichenologists at the time thought this was totally ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of entertaining to read those articles mm -hmm. at, from that time. Mm -hmm. But then uh, 50 years later, uh, Stahl was actually able to separate the partners and resynthesize a lichen. This recent synthesis of lichens is actually very difficult, and it maybe there were five, six times it, it worked over the last uh, 60, 70 years. Why is that? We don't really know why, because if we would know why, we would just work on it and mm -hmm. make it easier. Mm -hmm. However, it, now it looks actually that it's not only a fungal and an algal or cyanobacterial partner, but that there are many other organisms that we can find in these lichens. And here again, genetic methods allow you to, to find a lot of different bacteria and fungi that seem to be specific to these lichens. And now the idea is maybe they play a role. They are not just there, but they play some kind of role to help with the symbiotic system. What that is, is currently just speculation, so we have to wait maybe another 20, 30 mm -hmm. years until I can answer that question. <laughs> well, I'm already speculating that in the Q&A we will get from a very specific field of biology to sociology parallels, to philosophy, <laughs> to quite some other fields, but let me conclude the question part with the number three of those subtitles, which will bring us to climate change. So the 
So its subtitle is How Fungi Shape Our Futures. <clears throat> the adaptation capacity seems unequaled, like in formings, fungi occur in all ecosystems from the polar regions to the tropics and they grow on rock, soil, wood, bark and also living leaves as we have seen. A number of studies have demonstrated the capacity of lichens to even survive when exposed to the hostile, hostile environment of a flight through space. On the other hand, your team at the Field Museum has published recently a study which shows the impact by climate change which might bring the ability of fungi to adapt to its limits. Yeah, the, uh, on the one hand lichens are very tough. Mm -hmm. uh, you can even when they are dry you can put them in liquid nitrogen and they survive. Uh, you can put uh, them into acetone, get all the substances out, and they will survive. Um, a Swiss colleague, Rosmeyer Honegger, who was a professor, she's now retired in uh, Zurich, she put lichens in a coffee grinder and then <laughs> put it out, and they would grow out to, uh, to lichens again. Um, try this with a mammal or mm. so. <laughs> <laughs> or don't try it. <laughs> Um, however, they can also be very sensitive. You have to keep in mind that uh, a symbiotic association is not always a happy marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes and, uh, partners treat each other really badly when they don't perform as the other partner expects. That's the reason why coral bleaching happens so fast. Corals are also symbiotic organisms, mm -hmm. an animal together with algae. When the algae do not perform well, they don't do enough photosynthesis because the water is too warm, the usual reaction of the coral is just get rid of those and get someone else in. So when you have these increases in temperatures, you have a very fast reaction. Similarly, lichens can react very fast when there are other stresses. One stress that was very prominent in the 60s and 70s was air pollution through mm -hmm. sulfur dioxide. Uh, so we had what was called a lichen desert. Usually the cities were totally, uh, mm -hmm. uh, there were hardly any lichens or very few species uh, present and you really had to go outside. Um, and the reason is that the algal partner has to give 70 to 80 percent of the carbon that is fixed through photosynthesis to the fungal partner. So it's like a poor student and then you take the uh, support from the student and then uh, they suffer even more. In a similar way those algae suffered even more and then uh, died and the lichens died. The problem with, we had uh, changes in temperature all over time. Mm -hmm. There was always circulation. The reason, uh, I mean, the reason why we have this nice lake, which is really a plus of the city, is that this was a glacier here. Mm -hmm. So, and that's also the reason why the, the area surrounding uh, Chicago is so, so flat, because the glaciers just made it flat. However, the problem with the climate change now is that it's rapid. So we're not talking about a million years, we're talking about 50 years maybe. So there is a rapid change and then it is more difficult for species to adapt. Another problem for the adaptation of species is that we have all these cities, we have agricultural areas, so if a species wants to move, it is, there are a lot of barriers that didn't exist before. So there are a lot of, of issues. Um, an example of a historical uh, barrier would be seen in Europe. So when you look at, at tree species in Europe and in North America, there's a huge difference. You have many more tree species in North America than in mm -hmm. Europe. I noticed this when I had my first field trip to North America and I asked for the species of the oak tree and this 
botany professor looked at the tree and said, nah, I'm not sure. I was thinking, this is ridiculous. All my students need to know all the oak species in Europe, but we have three. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you have a huge <laughs> difference in diversity. The reason is a barrier. In this case, the barrier were the Alps. So when a species had to move south, suddenly there were the glaciers in the Alps. Mm -hmm. So there was only, only a few species could survive by escaping either west in France or east to the Balkan mm -hmm. route. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have, and now you have these anthropogenic barriers. So you will have a number of species uh, becoming extinct. And you can look at what you can do now, which is the great thing about the Field Museum and other museums with large collections. And we say, nobody counted the number, we are about 40 million specimens and objects. You can use them to, to use the data to have an idea where was the natural occurrence of these species and how did it change over time. And this is, you don't even, you don't look at, a, uh, at 10 years or five years, you can look at 100 years. So you have like a time capsule and this allows you to, to get some modeling that gives you information on what would happen if the temperature increases another or two other centigrades? Thank you very much. I'm not sure how resistant this quite important number of lichens are, which carry second name you're either Lumpshi or Lumpsiana, because you have the honor that quite a number of lichens bear. Uh, your name, which kind of shows your position in this uh, field of, uh, of research. But with this, I would like to open uh, to, to questions. Please, Sam. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I was wondering, what are lichens' relationship with time? Do they have a certain life cycle, and do they have a relationship with the day, or the cycle of seasons, or the year? It really depends. Uh, on the species or the, the, the group of genera or so, but also where do these lichens occur? So in the Namib Desert, they have uh, an early rise where they are active for about an hour when the dew falls and it's wet. Then they dry out. Uh, after about an hour, they stay dormant for the rest of the day and then they wait until the next day. So consequently, the growth of these lichens is very slow. Uh, even slower is the growth of lichens in the dry valleys in, in Antarctica. A colleague of mine went to a place where he took photographs of lichens that were photographed, exactly the same lichens were photographed 100 years ago by an expedition. And they marked the rocks so he could actually see this and you see the photo of from 100 years ago and now, you cannot really see a lot of difference. So if the growth was so slow all the time, they must be over a thousand years old. Then you go to the tropical rainforest, some tiny lichens on leaves, they can only live for two years or so because then the leaf falls down and they will, it will be decomposed. So it really depends on, on the species. You have some lichens that grow in deserts that are dormant most of the time, they live longer. You have other species in montane rainforest where they are wet all the time and they are physiologically active during the day when they can do photosynthesis. There the problem is it can be too wet because in the evening you would lose a lot of energy when you're still physiologically active, but you cannot get new carbon. So those species actually have a lot of very hydrophobic substances that they produce to really have like a, a dry chamber inside to make sure that there is no oversaturation of water. So it really depends on the ecology of the species. Tom, please. Uh, I'm mostly um, 
familiar with lichen from like hikes in the Swiss Alps, let's say, yeah. where you have a, you know, a bare rock and they um, you know, grow in the most spectacular colors. What is, what is the purpose of color in a lichen? It's a sunscreen. So the color, actually, if you would cut those lichens, and some of these are crustal, so it's difficult to cut, you would see that the pigment is only on the upper surface and the upper cortex of these lichens. So it's really UV protection. Uh, and there, there are some strategies. It depends on the species. Some have yellowish or orange uh, pigments. Others are black. So the, the result is the same. You make sure that no light goes through. However, when you are black, so when you have a lot of melanoids as a lichen, the problem is that you also heat up very quickly. So you cannot, in the Alps it might be okay, but if you are in a tropical uh, uh, mountain area, it's not so, such a great idea to have melanoids you're better off having pigments. And you can see this, that when you go to Iceland, you see a lot of species that either have color, and then the same number of species are melanoids, so blackish, brownish. But when you go to Mount Kenya, for example, you find no uh, melanoid species. So because there, you would overheat, and then that would be a problem for the species. So lichens have no mouth, no stomach, no brain. But I've read that they have an impressive system of decision making and decision taking. Uh, for example, in the, in the spreading out, in the uh, developing against uh, against obstacles. Could you tell us a little bit how this how this works? Well, first of all, the partner choice is very complicated mm -hmm. in these lichens. So you have to, to uh, see that uh, a fungal partner usually only associates with one species of algae. And they have to find those species. So there are some strategies. Instead of doing sexual reproduction where you have spores and then the spore germinates and needs to find a new partner, you can have asexual reproduction and basically have little instant lichens that either you attract mites or so to, to eat and transport the, those uh, propagules or you use wind or water or so. That's one strategy and that's very common. And it is very effective for new habitats. Mm -hmm. So when you have young twigs, or when you go to, um, there was a new island uh, uh, off the coast of Iceland through volcanic eruption uh, originating, most of the species have these asexual spores. They basically bring both partners together there. But then there are also some species that are more relaxed, especially when you go to Antarctica and you go to areas where you have very few algal species available. Suddenly, unrelated species, fungal species, can associate with the same partner that is there. Well, they better do, because otherwise they couldn't survive in this <laughs> habitat. So there are these kind of um, ways to, to adapt. Then. The, uh, the substances that they produce can help them to survive in specific habitats. And I use an example since you mentioned the Swiss Alps. There's a species that occurs in these, well, I don't know the English term for Schneetälchen. So there are areas where you have snow, uh, even in early summer, still snow mm -hmm. there, and then over a short period of the summer, it's very wet there. And this lichen, this lichen species only occurs in this habitat. So how does it make sure that it's not oversaturated with water? Because it's basically always, the feet are always wet. 
So it has, when you collect this lichen, the lower surface is orange-yellow. And the substance that it produces, called solarinic acid, because the lichen is called solarina, so scientists are not very inventive with names. <laughs> Um, but solarinic acid is the most hydrophobic substances that is known from fungi. Mm -hmm. It's so, we used it as a standard when I did uh, some chemical analysis. You use a standard, a very hydrophilic that goes through the uh, column very quickly. And then this is the last one. So and in between, you just calculate when things elude, when they show up. So, but this allows the lichen to be dry in a wet environment. So they are surprising adaptation of species to their habitat. Another example is that you find a lot of lichens that are like hairs. The, the structure is like hairs. And you always find them in mountain forests, in different groups of lichens, in different habitats, from Mount Kenya to, to the Pacific Northwest or so. It's clear why they do it. They can basically, it's like a comb. They can get the water that they use then for, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. for their survival. Mm -hmm. Can these symbioses create, um, create themselves spontaneously? You seem to say that they can form. Yeah. yeah. So they, um, these are usually species that always form lichens, and then when they find the right partner, the symbiosis starts. However, you have a very good point, because there are two uh, problems with this. One is, it has been shown that there are a few species that can be lichenized, but they can also be um, parasites on trees. That's very rare, but it happens. And we don't really know what triggers, what kind of lifestyle they have. We only know it's the same fungal species that can be associated with different partners. Another problem is when you are in a mutualistic symbiotic relationship, you give something, you get something. Over evolutionary time, why do you give something? Isn't it much easier to be a parasite and just take and not give anything? And this actually happens. In lichens, you have, um, there is this group of, of nice lichens, actually one of the largest families in, in fungi, that has most of the really showy lichens, like leaves or, or shrubs and so. But then, when we started with genetic studies 100 years ago, we found some weird fungi that fell within those lichens. And my first reaction was, oh, contamination. Let's do it over again. And we did it over again and over again. But we, in reality, these are what we call cheaters. They are fungi that then parasitize other species, actually closely related species, of lichens. So they basically have the philosophy of, why should I give something to a Alga, I just live on a lichen and just take everything there. So you have this kind of dynamic in the process of symbiosis over evolutionary time. Uh, there has to be like a complex system to make sure that it stays mutualistic, and lichens don't seem to be very good at that. One last question. <clears throat> when you think about <clears throat> samples that were taken by, say, Captain Cook's Voyager or Darwin. Um, when you look at those specimens, are they different? Have they changed over time? Or are they similar to what you would find today? Are they unique? Surprisingly, the specimens generally look like they were collected yesterday, most of them. So when you keep them dry, they stay very well, and, and you, can, you can easily recognize. So I remember I once had the privilege to visit the Linnean Herbarium in London. They have it in, like, in the basement, very uh, safe there. And um, 
the lichens that he collected, he didn't collect very many because he didn't think they were interesting, but you can see exactly what kind of species they are. They look like something that was collected a few years ago. Um, so they, they really stay the same. However, what you can see when you have not the few specimens that, that uh, and Darwin collected a few lichens as well, but not very many. But when you have a collection from an area where a lot was collected, and then you go to the same area 50 years later, you actually see quite a lot of differences. Um, and back in Germany, I, when I was a student, I had this uh, job to, uh, to work on an old herbarium, like an herbarium that someone who was a priest, uh, collected these specimens around 1850. And he put them in old newspapers. It was interesting to read those church newspapers because he was a, 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 a Catholic uh, priest and apparently they had a lot of problems with the Protestants at the time. So they were really <laughs> harsh words used in these newspapers. Um, but those specimens, I then recorded, had a list of, uh, of where he collected those, and I went to the localities, and you saw quite a lot of change over the 100 years uh, in between. Sometimes some soil lichens were now as forest, but sometimes some lichens where air pollution just diminished the population, they disappeared. Well, get the impression we, we talked again about a very specific field of biology, but sometimes I had the impression we talk about conquest, about power struggle, about sociology, about uh, exploration. In, in human history, I think there, there are parallels, and I think a lot can be learned by showing interest in, in lichens and uh, how they work, adapt and, uh, and help for communication. Dr. Lumsch, thank you so much for accepting the, the invitation, for sharing with us uh, some insights into a very complex uh, field of uh, research. Thank you so much. Thank you.